welcome back to the show. You know, sometimes we make it a point of saying that an episode will be a lot of fun, and they often are. In theory, <laughs> but today's show is legit fun. It's about how Chinese people like to make friends, IRL, or in real life. If you aren't down with the hip interwebs lingo from about fifteen years ago, so what you're saying is you're old. Nah, just acknowledging it. Anyway, there's much more to having fun here than going to KTV and drinking baijiu. Right, like fa hong bao or sending red envelopes of money to people. Right, that's fun too. I love to receive them myself. So if anyone needs my WeChat, okay,、um, not so fast. <laughs> We're also going to talk about a few of the hotter aspects of real life here. Just in case anyone thinks we are focusing too much on the millennial influencer entrepreneurial class, it's equal time day here on how China works, and I know I learned a lot as we researched this that sobered me up a little. So let's get to it. Okay, let's start by agreeing on a common frame of reference. How about we look at, say, a typical weekend for Western versus Chinese folks, maybe young adults hanging out with friends. Sounds good. What do people usually do where you are from to have fun? On weekends or holidays, people back home might go out to shop, eat, see a movie, or maybe go to a club or party at someone's home at night. But we typically roll in smaller units, either as a duo, like a date type situation, or maybe with one friend as a wingman or wingwoman, and then we meet other friends when we're out. But I'd say that going out solo and then meeting up with someone at the venue is among the most common ways to go. The main thing I noticed from my time in the United States is there are just not as many people on the street as there are here in China. This is true, unless you have a bunch of kids to entertain or are on a group trip specifically, like say a church or school trip. Fun in the U.S. typically isn't designed as a street-oriented group kind of thing. That's such a significant cultural difference. True, true, true. You know, us Chinese people like to have loud fun in groups, right?、Mm-hmm. We talked about it on the previous episode. We called it real now. Yeah, you know what we call it back home when people gather in loud groups on the street and raise hell? What? A riot <laughs> or the resistance or maybe spring break. I miss spring break. But back to your story. I miss spring break too. I was student in the United States. Remember? That's right. But yeah, Chinese people like to get a group of friends together for almost everything. Besides shopping, there's going to the gym and taking interesting class together on things like photography or dance or learning a new skill, and of course, eating. I like food. <laughs> we really enjoy the real now camaraderie that comes from sharing the good times with people we like, and the more the merrier, as you might say. Have you enjoyed some of this since living in China yourself? Well, as for me personally, I'm more of an introverted guy, believe it or not. Although I play an extrovert for work and on shows like this. You had me fooled. Yeah, but I was really quiet as a kid too until you got me going. My mom used to say that they spent the first two years trying to get me to talk, and all the time since then trying to get me to shut up. <laughs> Now she meant it with love, I think. But the point sticks. I don't really love large groups by default. I'm just not wired that way. How about you? Well, I'm not a typical person for where I'm from, as you know. This is true. I've learned to enjoy more of the Western way of spending time with one person or smaller groups too. But I am a Chinese, so if there's a big group having fun and I like the people in it, I'm probably going to have a great time. Another way that Chinese people have big group fun is with dancing. You're telling me that the group dancing we see in public squares, big and small, here has its roots in antiquity. Right. People used to dance in elaborate formations for the emperors and leaders of all times, so there is a sense of history to it. But it's done nowadays as more of fun and a social form of exercise. I've got to say, when I see those groups of mostly older ladies over by my neighborhood shopping mall doing that freeform disco tai chi to some bad local EDM, which is to say EDM, it really warms my black little heart. That's called Guangchang Wu. Cool. In case people haven't seen it, it's generally a group of middle-aged women dancing in groups as a healthy way to spend some time. My mom loved this herself. It's pretty unique. Some of you lao wai think it's a party, but the party concept is quite different. Although the music is like, mm-t, 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 mm-t. <laughs> now it's really similar other than the music to what's called line dancing、mm-hmm. in country western circles, and I've heard it called line dancing here too. So I guess I'm not alone in that comparison. <gasps> One other thing we can compare is barbecue. I love me some barbecue. How do you do them back home? Well, there are plenty of restaurants that serve various kinds of barbecue. But if you're doing it at someone's home, they have to have a grill for starters. Usually, people bring different items, whether side dishes or drinks or even their own grill items, depending on the host budget and the friends. But most often, the host provides the meat, main veggies, and drinks, and then asks the guests to bring anything extra they want to. You know, maybe a dessert or something. Now, the Chinese style of barbecue is very different. 
Barbecue here is really a great social tool which reflects our culture. We call it lu chuar, which is meat and veggies on the metal or bamboo stick. Those are cooked on the grill or over flame. Similar to how you guys do it, but it's not done by people themselves that often. Yeah, it's more of a restaurant thing, or done at a roadside stand. Yeah, the local style is for everyone to sit on the little stool and talking and laughing and enjoying the food and beer, feeling very comfortable hanging out with each other. Yeah, I'm getting pretty hungry right now, but keep going. <laughs> Char is often enjoyed at some point during a night of drinking or clubbing, sometimes to guard against the alcohol or sometimes to soak it up. It's another fun group activity, even if you enjoy it with strangers by the grill. In the U.S., the thing that's closest to this is the food truck scene. Especially in major cities like Atlanta and L.A., food trucks that make all kinds of fast handheld foods are very popular. People likewise grab their food and they sit or stand and eat with everybody else, just enjoying themselves. It sounds fun. Yeah, you know, it really is, and it's just like here in that respect. The main difference is that food trucks have more of an upscale gourmet vibe. It's a real cuisine scene, as they say. The chefs are sometimes award-winning, and、mm. the prices reflect that. Wow. As we shift gears here, I want to share a reminder of something that I have heard before, but that's worth repeating. Remember that every culture can sometimes seem strange in the eyes of others, but what's strange to you might be fun or like home for someone else. So to eliminate misunderstandings and reduce prejudice, we would all do well to remember the idea of when in Rome, do as the Romans do. If we respect the culture of each place we visit and take a little piece of it with us when we leave, that will help make the whole world a better and more beautiful place. That's such a nice thought that we could end it there. But wait, there's more. Thanks, and yes, we want to add one more interesting point to this conversation, and that's regarding how to best build that guanxi with people to make friends in the first place. There's a guy here named Raz Galore, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, but I know who he is. He's pretty famous on the Chinese internet. Yeah, his Chinese name is Gao Yu Si. He has millions of followers online here. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Now Raz's secret is he's able to talk to foreigners from various countries about Chinese TV dramas, food, Chinese New Year, entertainment and leisure, all from being on the streets in Beijing with local people and sharing their perspectives. He may be the most popular foreigner in China. He's definitely one of them. Yes, he's a very nice guy, and he shared with me that secret of building guanxi or likability is here. Of course, one way is to let people know how much you like their food and local culture. If you're sincere, you'll never go wrong enjoying and complimenting someone's food almost anywhere. Right. I guess this is one of the secrets why he's so popular in China. And yeah, of course you cannot fake it. You have to taste things yourself and mean it. But the main tip here is just to engage with real life people here in China. Be down to earth, which in Chinese means 接地气 meaning being direct, honest, reliable, practical, and close to people's life. Yeah, Raz is clearly interested in ordinary folks' lives here, and he's immersed himself in being a local guy. He's like China's version of Mike Rowe, you know, the dirty jobs host. Yeah, that's right. Raz has really experienced the hard lives of ordinary Chinese working people, doing things such as helping out at breakfast stands in the morning, serving migrant workers on the streets in Beijing. He's also been a food delivery guy, riding scooters and running orders up to people for just a few quai per order. But maybe his craziest job was working with the Chinese railway staff during the Spring Festival, the biggest mass migration every year here in China. You know, it's like spring break. Only with a lot less bikinis and beer bongs, and more like half a million people crammed on the planes, trains, and automobiles heading home for the holidays to see family. So yeah, I guess it's actually nothing like spring break. Yeah, that's our Chun Yun. It's pretty wild, and without experiencing this yourself, I don't think you can say you understand China. Before we go, we want to drop a few numbers on you to illustrate that the kind of middle class fun we're talking about here really doesn't apply to everyone. Empathy is important, and we want to show some for the less fortunate folks out there. Right, China is very diverse. We now not only have the world's greatest number of billionaires, we also have the biggest middle class as well as the highest numbers of outbound international students. But we also lead in less desirable numbers, such as the number of poor and illiterate people, and in both volume and degree of literacy, we have a huge population of disabled people here too. 
In 2017, China had 30 million people with an annual income of less than 2,300 yuan. That's about 465 U.S. dollars. And for that same year, last year, there were almost 61 million illiterate people. Now, that's a rate of 5.2% of the total giant population. In terms of people with disabilities, this is from a different study, so it's a little bit older. But as of the end of 2010, the total number of disabled people reported in China was 85 million, including 25 million people with severe disabilities who require our full-time care. Of course, everyone needs friends, and being on the internet is part of it. When we're working and poor people stay in touch is via Kuaishou. That's a very popular short video app with 110 million daily active users in China. This platform positions itself not as a home for the shiny, happy, aspirational types, but instead it's aimed at highlighting the daily lives of people from less developed areas in the country. In a sense, the Kuaishou app allows the true life heroes to shine, representing the endurance, diligence, candidness, and optimism of the ordinary citizens when they're facing challenges and hardships. It gives them a chance to share lives and hobbies with people. Perhaps many years from now, when internet archaeologists want to know the true look of China in 2018, they will look at Kuaishou for some of the answers. Maybe so. I understand that a criticism of the platform is sometimes that the content or users of Kuaishou are low, meaning inelegant or have poor taste, etc. And there is a rep for sharing some more kind of vulgar content to grab eyeballs. But everyone doesn't live in a tier 1 city or have a Balenciaga ball cap, even a fake one, or even want to. Lots of people have much more fundamental needs, and their tastes reflect their reality. Yes, remember that in China, out of every 100 people, only 14 of them, or 14%, finished high school. Nine of those 100 went on to college, but only three finished and got an undergraduate degree. It's important to remember that not everyone has the same superior conditions. And of course, then there's that old parable about before judging someone, you should first walk a mile in their shoes. Thanks, Ying Ying. That was a pretty heavy dose of reality to end with. But we wanted to share some perspective to further illustrate why we produce this show the way we do. We want to have and be as fun as possible, but there's so much talk in the news right now as we say these words about how dangerous China's rise is that I, we, felt it was important to give some damn context here. If you're an outsider and hope to understand this place, you have to not only learn a bunch of fun facts and helpful tips, you have to also take them to heart and widen your perspective. Now, I'm just about the last guy to preach at anyone, but if we're going to meet the insane challenges of the near-term future, we really have to start thinking and acting less as tribes and more in line with the Brotherhood of Man ideals. To that end, tomorrow's show is all about brotherhood and sisterhood, meaning the values and traditions of men and women and boys and girls as friends in groups here. We're shifting up from the original point a little, but we want this to be relevant, and this is a topic that we need to look at now. Agreed. Okay, that's enough from us for today, though. I'm Brendan Davis. And I'm Ying Ying Li. See you tomorrow on How China Works.